me, John chapter 4, we'll start in verse 1. <clears throat> when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized, or that, yes, that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it? that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then... Hast thou that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of, lip, of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, and neither come here to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus saith unto her, said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for you have five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. So in this you said truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Very perceptive. Verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say, you Jews, that is, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus saith to her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, and now is, or the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto Him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When He is come, He will tell us all things. And here's the revelation. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples, and from this point on, it's going to be our focus tonight. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he saith unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore, said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat, anything to eat? And Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, don't you say, There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say to you, Lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already for harvest. And when he that reapeth receiveth wages, gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, that whereon you bestowed no labor, other men labored, 
and you are entered into their labors. And that's all we'll read tonight. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And, and God, I pray that you would use it tonight to make change in us. And Lord, help us to be like Jesus. I pray that that would start with me. He had such a passion for people, and I pray that we would catch that. And you'd do a work in our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 How many of you are passionate about food? Any foodies here? All right, a couple. I'm about to make you all. All right? Just this week, I was sitting across from Brother Martin here. We were having a meal at the church, and he asked me, he said, what's your favorite food? And, and I began to, to think and to list for him some dishes, some of my favorite dishes that Christine makes. Uh, she makes a wonderful chicken parmesan and different variations of it. It's delicious with some garlic bread. That's wonderful. One of my favorites. Uh, this week, she made a full-blown Italian lasagna, and that, that was delicious. Brother Don, I know you like that back there, <laughs> some lasagna. And, uh, and, you know, probably made me gain some weight this week. I've eaten it several times. Uh, been awesome. Even last night, she made some great Thai fried rice, and it's always good. It's, you know, chicken Thai fried rice. Anybody like that? All right. I'm not talking to any foodies now. You're thinking, thinking along with me? But amidst all of that, I was telling Brother Martin these things. I, I think I left out probably the all-time favorite, and that has to be the one and only bacon, right? <laughs> bacon. You know, there was this one time I was in college, and, and me and Christine, we went to college together, and, um, and we woke up on a Saturday morning, and usually it was, it was our day off if we could, if we didn't have work, and so if it was our day off, we'd usually sleep in, but this was an unusual day. We got up for some reason or another, I don't remember what, but we got together, and we went to breakfast together at the dining hall, and there were like seven aisles of lanes of food you get to choose from, and we went and walked down all of them all the way to the end as our noses led us. Uh, by Providence, and we found there just these trays of piping hot bacon, right? Like full trays of it, and you take what you want. This is a buffet. So we took what we wanted and, and got us plates of bacon. It was, it was amazing. It was the best day of my life, right? You know, in all honesty, that was a wonderful experience for me and, and something that you can tell I have at least some degree of passion about. And when we're hungry, we all get passionate about food, right? I, like I said, I'll get you to that point. Anybody thinking about food now? You're <laughs> ready to pack up? We're going to have to hang on. But we have a burning desire to fill our bellies when we're hungry and satisfy that longing. If we get hungry enough, we might even turn to things like broccoli or Brussels sprouts, you know, which no sane person would do, right? <laughs> I can see you guys agree, all right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm joking, but, but to one degree or another, we're all passionate about food. And I know that because you eat, right? You eat, so do I. And then because we have some sort of passion about food and our stomach will make us get that way at times. And it's a need that we just have to fulfill. And most of us even like to, we like to fill our bellies with some good food. Well, in this passage, Jesus made such a revealing statement when he said in, in verse 34, my meat, that means food, my food is to do the will of him that sent me. And Jesus brought food into the equation when, when it had nothing to do with physical food. That's not what he's talking about. And so what is he talking about? He, he's using an illustration to help us understand the passion that he had for doing the Father's will. And then he would go on to spell out exactly what that will is in a lesson on passion for people. And that's why we're looking at this tonight. We're going to focus in on verses 31 through 38. And tonight we're going to follow the flow of, of this, the, these verses here with four major sections as we find out what God has for us. So stay with me as we go through. Uh, this first section we're going to look at is Jesus' mystery. And it's in verse 31 and, and following. And we'll see that in a minute. But So we, we read through this chapter and... I want you to get, I did that so that we can get the background to this mystery, because he sets up this mystery here for his disciples. But let me recap this story. So Jesus is on his way from Galilee to Judea, and the text reveals in verse 4 that he needed to go through Samaria. Why did he need to? Nobody knew, but it says that he needed to. The exact opposite path from what any normal Jew would take. This was... This was not the way that they would take. They would go around Samaria. And so as he did that, Jesus got tired. We were told that he was wearied. 
And probably, we can imagine, very hungry, too. This was not a short trip they were taking. And so he stopped and rested at the well as the disciples went on into the town to get some food, to get some meat, which is, like I said, food. And so as Jesus waited, a Samaritan woman shows up. And Jesus, in the most amazing and loving way possible, he witnesses the good news to her, that the Messiah indeed has come, and the Messiah is him. That's what he tells her about. That's the good news. And he tells that to her. And she accepts that good news. And she runs off to tell everyone in town. And then as Jesus continues to wait at the well, at some point there, very, you know, very close in time frame, because the disciples did see that Samaritan woman talking with Jesus, they showed up, showed back up with the food. And maybe they stood off at a distance and let him finish his conversation with her before coming to him. Because they, it says there that nobody asked. They didn't ask each other, what's he doing with her? They just kind of observed. Jesus is with this woman, then she runs off. And so that's, that's where we pick up here in verse 31. I want you to see Jesus' mystery. Look at it again, verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him. So they, they ignore, they pass over this, this odd scene of Jesus, a Jewish man speaking to a woman and a Samaritan woman. They, they pass that over. All right, let's, let's just let him do what he's going to do. He's a, little, he's a little weird, does some things out of the ordinary. Um, and so they pass that over. And in verse 31, it says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Have any man brought him aught or anything to eat? You know, they look at each other. Did, did somebody bring him food that we're missing? So the disciples show up, and they present the food to Jesus that they've bought from back there in the town. And they're probably excited to help him and, and make sure that he receives the nourishment that he needs, right? You can imagine they're, they're doing him a favor here. They're, they're being a blessing to Jesus. They're helping him, providing him with food. And he was a man. He did need to eat. And so they tell him, Master, eat. But he comes back with this statement that throws them for a spin. He says, I've got food that you don't know about. And the disciples, we find, you know, they look at each other and, and they're just like, where, where does he have food at? Did you bring him food? Did you bring him food? And they're probably looking to see if his pockets are bulging. But they, they don't find any food, no physical food there. And they were really lost. They were, they were truly lost. And we probably would have been too. But this was a mystery to them, not to Jesus. And the mystery was there because they were thinking only in physical terms. And Jesus was thinking spiritually. And the truth is, sometimes you and I don't understand what God's saying to us either. And many times we get caught up thinking about physical, earthly things when we need to be having the mind of Christ. We need to be dwelling on spiritual things, on things that are higher than, than just what He's here, flesh and blood. Colossians 3, verse 2 says, Set your affection, that your thinking, your mind, on things above, not on things on the earth. Thankfully, it didn't take long for the disciples to find out the meaning because Jesus wanted them to know right away what he was talking about. He didn't let this go on long. It was a mystery. They looked around. Who's, where, what food is he talking about? And we would have done the same because the truth is oftentimes we're thinking physical. We're thinking earthly. We're thinking monetary and all of that. But Jesus is thinking spiritually, and that's where our mind needs to be. So he's going to clear it up. And this was going to be one of their most important lessons yet. So that's Jesus' mystery. Secondly, I want you to see Jesus' meat. Look at verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He says, My meat, and that's translated food. My food is to do the will of him that sent me. Who's that? God. And to finish his work. And what he is saying, it's remarkable, and it comes in two clear parts. But first, what does it mean when he says meat or food? While we would all think physical first, because we do, we, don't, we never say food and mean anything else. We think food, hungry, bellies, feed me, food. And while we would all think like that, Jesus is talking spiritual. He's speaking about what occupies his mind, not his stomach. And he's speaking of passion. He had a passion which overwhelmed even the bodily desires that he did have. 
He faced hunger. He was surely hungry from his journey. But, but what was going on in his spirit and his mind was greater than that to him because he wanted to think spiritually first. He was hungry physically, yes, but more than that, he was spiritually hungry. And the filling of that burning passion only came by doing the Father's will. And that's what he states here. Jesus was serious about the Father's will. We know those famous words that he prayed in the garden. We sang about it tonight in one of our songs. Not my will, but thine be done. He was serious about the Father's will. And the will of God is what drove Jesus. And here's the truth. It drives anyone who is filled with the Spirit. Anyone who's filled with the Spirit, I'm talking in the moment, if you are filled with the Spirit, then you're driven, your passion is the will of God. That's what you want to do. Wearsby made this remark about it. He said, The will of God ought to be a source of strength and satisfaction to the child of God, just as if he sat down to a sumptuous feast. We're talking about food here, right? We, 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 we get strength and satisfaction from eating a good meal. But the will of God ought to be that for a Christian. And so before we start making assumptions about the will of God, though, and what that is, we need to look at the text here to find out what, what's going on. What is the will of God? And in verse 4, Jesus stated this. We've looked at it once already. I must needs go through Samaria. And what we find in the story is that he had a divine appointment at the well in Sychar that he refused to miss. Yes, he knew the future, but he was hungry. And, and he could have said, you know, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go to the town with them too because I just can't wait. I've got to eat. But his, his hunger was more spiritual than it was physical. He had great physical hunger, but greater spiritual hunger. So his desire, his passion was to go through Samaria and to stop at Sychar for this divine appointment. And so this tells us something about what the will of God is. It was God's will that Jesus be there so that he could share the good news with this woman. God's heart and his will is that people would be saved, and we have that promise in, the, in his word. God is not willing that any would perish, but what? That all would come to repentance. This is the will of God that's being spoken of here. And there's added evidence by what Jesus said next. He not only said that doing the will of God who sent him, that that was his meat, his food, but also in verse 34, he said that it was about finishing his work. And if you have your Bible, look over in John 17 with me. Look at John 17. Jesus would bring up this statement again, finishing his work. And he'd make a connection here about what God's work for him was. John 17, look at verse 1. I love to hear your Bibles flipping. John 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven, praying and says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. Here it is. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus equates the work that God gave him to do as bringing, he equates that with bringing as many people as possible into eternal life. You saw that there, right? He says, I, I, I've done it. I've done all that you've given me. It brought them to eternal life. And this is the work that God gave him to do. And you know how that came about? Bringing those people? By his witness. Not by angels whispering in people's ear. By his witness. By him going out, having a passion for people and reaching them. We, if you were to turn back a chapter, you'd see in John chapter 3, Jesus and who? Nicodemus, right? Where we get that great passage about being born again. That's Jesus' witness. And there are many examples in, in, the, in the Gospels here, and many that we don't have that weren't recorded, that John would say would fill heaven and earth to write about it all. Uh, he had a personal witness that was vibrant, and it was consuming him. He had a passion for people that consumed him. 
And while this was a wonderful moment for Jesus personally, as he had just witnessed to this sinful woman and, and seen her trust in him for salvation, he had greater vision than even just her. And he wanted his disciples to catch this passion as well. So we've seen Jesus there in his mystery. Then we've seen his meat. I want you to see his mandate in verse 35. Look at verse 35. John chapter 4, back there. He says to his disciples, Say not ye, don't you say, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. So Jesus now directs a rhetorical question to his disciples that seems to be a common saying in their day. He says, don't you say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? And yes would be the normal answer to that. Yes, that, that's, that's true. That's what we say and that's how it goes. But remember, Jesus is speaking spiritually here. And so he gives a three-part command that we need to see tonight. The first command is, listen up. He says in verse 35, Behold, I say to you, Behold, this is an imperative to, to get our attention. And use here with, I say unto you, means listen to what I'm about to say. He's saying, listen to me. I'm about to say something important, so listen up. Behold. You know, generally in the middle of talking, and he is in the middle of talking. He's already said some things before in verse 34. But in the middle of the talking, you don't say, listen up unless it's really important and somebody is not catching it. And he's trying to get them here from physical to spiritual. Think spiritually with me. You know, oftentimes this happens with children who are kind of here, there, and everywhere, and they need to be trained on how to listen. I do it all the time with Caden and now with Cyrus. You know, hey, listen up. In the middle of talking, like all of a sudden they're like, hey, listen up. Maybe now I'll, I'll try it a little different. Behold, <laughs> listen up. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. But, but Jesus says it here, and he says, hey, this is important. In the middle of his talking, hey, this is important, so listen up. So this is not only something they needed to hear, but us too. And we do. We need to listen up. It's so important that we listen to Jesus, listen to his words. And so he gives a second command. After listen up, he says, look up. Verse 35, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Get them up there and look out further than yourself, further than your bellies. Get your eyes up and look. Jesus is continuing the spiritual metaphor. And I believe that at this moment, Jesus was indeed physically telling them to look up. Because there was a swarm of Samaritans that were coming out. They were on their way to meet Jesus. And what a shock that this must have been to the disciples. I mean, they saw the one Samaritan woman, but she left, and, and now it would appear that there are a whole bunch of them coming out to Jesus. You know, I was a camp counselor uh, for many years. I was talking with somebody about that this week, but I did that throughout um, my college summers, and um, Christine did that with me as well. It was a blast. But one summer we had the privilege, and we got to go to, the I think it was called the Miami Zoo or uh, well, no, we did the Miami Zoo. This was somewhere else. But it was a really neat place. Got to take the kids to some sort of zoo. And they had there a liger. Anybody ever seen a liger? All right, I thought that was a fairy tale. How many of you thought that was a fairy tale? All right, it's real. A liger. It's a lion and a tiger mixed together. And they can't breed themselves, but they can be bred to a, a liger. It was huge. It was awesome. It was a sight to behold. Right, And I have this, this row of little duckling kids behind me as we're walking along and we come up to this cage and we're looking at this liger and it's, it's, it's laying there and it's standing up and walking around. And it was a sight to behold. And some of my campers, I look back and guess what they're doing? Right, right there in front of the thing, not looking up to see this, this amazing sight to behold. They're missing it. And so... You know, I had to say to them, hey, look up. You're missing something amazing that's right here in front of you. That's exactly what Jesus calls us to do here. Look up. He's going to tell them why, but listen up, behold, and look up. Get your eyes up. Stop thinking about yourself and everything you've got going on. Look up. And we're talking here about a passion for people. Look up. You've got neighbors who need the Lord. Look up you got friends, maybe from childhood, 
that need the Lord. Look up, you've got family that needs the Lord. Look up, there's people you work with who need the Lord. Look up, there's people in this room who need the Lord. Look up. That's what he's telling them. And every time a Christian gets in proximity of a lost person, it's a time to look up. We ought to see it that way. Every time I have the privilege of being in the presence of a lost person, it's a time to look up. So who is it that you need to look up for? Have you been ignoring them? Have you been thinking about yourself? Who is it? We were talking with the seniors this week. Brother Martin brought a great uh, challenge from God's Word about, about this subject. There are people out there. They need the Lord. Are we looking for them? We need to look up. So that's the second command. The third is gather up. Look at verse 35 again. He says, they are white already to harvest. And this is an implied command then, to gather up. What does this mean? For a farming community, it made perfect sense. When the corn was ripe in its season, it would have a white top, and that meant that it was time to harvest and, and near being overdue time. It was time. The time is now. There was no more time to wait. This was important, and it needed to be done now. And so when Jesus says harvest, he's using agricultural terms to refer to leading someone to Christ. Right? Can you, can you get that? But we should notice three similarities when it comes to both physical and spiritual harvest time. There, there are some great similarities. Jesus knew what he was doing. He's the master teacher after all. And here's one similarity. Harvest time, harvest time is labor. It's hard. It's work. Harvest time is labor. In a physical sense, it's no easy process. You have to cut the standing grain with a scythe. Uh, or a sickle, you have to tie the stalks into sheaves and then take the, the harvested crops to the threshing floor and on the process goes. Harvesting was hard work physically. But spiritually, in a spiritual sense, to lead someone to Christ, it takes time. It takes understanding. It takes knowledge. It takes relying on the Holy Spirit. And it even involves spiritual warfare, which is no joke, because Satan opposes that very process. He wants nothing, to, does not want it to, to take place, doesn't want it to be completed. And I guarantee if you're leading someone to the Lord, there is spiritual warfare going on. I promise that. And so it takes work to harvest. It's not only labor, it's lucrative. It's rewarding. You know, physically, when you're, when you're harvesting, oftentimes extra help would be hired because it was going to be worth it to get all the help you could get, to get all the crops in that you could get. And they would receive their wages. They'd be paid for it. Jesus is about to talk about that. The, the laborers, they're worthy of their hire for the harvest because you want to get all the harvest you can. It's going to be worth it. It's rewarding. And spiritually, Jesus is going to spell this out for us in the next verses. But I tell you, if you've ever had the privilege to lead someone to the Lord, there is nothing like it. There's nothing like it. In the moment, it's amazing. But better than that, the results last forever, and God is glorified. It, it's worth it. It's rewarding, lucrative. Third similarity in physical and spiritual harvesting is that it's limited. It is limited. A harvest is limited. There's an end to it. And harvest time doesn't last forever. The plants physically will go bad if you don't get them in time. And the same is true in witnessing. What does the gospel mean? Good news. What does the gospel mean? Good news. Good news. And I gave you this quote last week, but it's worth our attention again. Someone said this. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. It's only good news if it gets there in time. Harvest time is limited. And we must have a passion for people enough to step out of our comfort zone and tell them about Christ. Because it's time is limited that we have. So according to Jesus' command, let's listen up, look up, and gather up. He says the harvest is there. Do we believe Him? If we believe Him, we'll act like it. We'll show it with our actions, and we'll be about harvesting. So I want you to see finally Jesus' motivation. His motivation. Look at verse 36. He says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. 
And herein is that saying true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you are entered into their labors. When I say Jesus' motivation, really it's our motivation. He's giving us motivation. And he provides a great motivation for participating in harvest work here. And it's this. Just simply put, harvest work is worth it. It is worth it. And the thought that really struck me as I read this was the end of verse 36. He says, He that soweth and he that reapeth rejoice together. So there's two parties represented here, and though they are different, ultimately they end up in the same place. The ones who sow and the one who reaps, they end up the same. Doing what? Rejoicing. Have you ever sown the gospel seed into somebody's life and not seen the fruit of it? You ever done that? Maybe time and time and time again, over and over, you've told them, you've prayed, you've told them. You may have spent years witnessing and praying for someone while never seeing them come to Christ. And maybe, maybe at this point you've even lost contact. That can seem discouraging for sure. I can think of several people in my mind that come to mind like that, for me personally. But we never know when someone is going to accept Christ. You never know when somebody is. That's not up to you. But what we can know is that when the time does come and someone does trust Christ, both the ones who have sowed a gospel seed in the past and the one who is leading them to Christ, this final one, this harvester that's being talked about, both of them will ultimately rejoice together. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. You don't save anyone. God gives the increase, right? And you never know when that time is that someone is going to come to Christ. So don't be discouraged about it. Do all you can do. Lead the results up to God, knowing that one day you'll get to rejoice together over those that have. But the truth is, it's worth it either way. Whether you're just a sower, doing your job sowing, and we all have that job who know the Lord, or reaping, and God, God will, will give that in His time, you get to rejoice together. And going along with this principle of sowers and reapers, Jesus gives His disciples the chance to participate in it right then. In verse 38, He tells them, I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. And, and personally, my understanding, I believe that he's speaking of what is about to take place in just a moment. Remember, he, he knows the future, knows the end from the beginning. And this is what I mean by that. Following the flow of this story, Jesus and, and others maybe in the past who had, who had worked on people from Samaria and, and maybe even that woman from, from Samaria, those who had put, sowed gospel seeds into their lives were not the disciples. They were other, other people in the past. And then Jesus himself, who really put in this effort and, and harvested, led her to Christ. And so he's the one who put in this initial work and literally went the extra mile to witness to this woman at the well. And after believing, she runs back to the town to tell everyone. And now they are streaming out of Samaria, coming to him where the disciples now are. They showed back up with the food. And they can see this. They're looking out at the, these, these ripe fields. And the fields are literally coming at them. And Jesus is telling them that you're about to get to participate in the harvest that others have worked for. What a lesson, right? I mean, he explains it to them and then says, here you go, participate, be a harvester with me. And he really was the master teacher. But I find a wonderful principle here that is true for us too. I've found that doing God's will in the present will lead to further opportunities in the future. And that's why it's so important to do the small things. Because doing God's will in the present, no matter how small, will lead to greater opportunities in the future. And this is exactly what's happening here. Jesus' passion for people and his effort to go out of the way to witness to one woman then resulted in a much greater opportunity. Can't you see it? It's wonderful. Harvest work is worth it. And to God be the glory for all of it. Jesus wanted to instill in His disciples a passion for people. 
My question for us tonight is, do you and I want a passion for people like Jesus had? I've struggled in thinking through that. I, I want that. I say I do. But do I work like it? Do I look up and look outside of myself to those who are around me? In fact, this, this morning during Buddy's message, the Lord brought to my mind somebody this week who I had a good interaction with, a positive interaction, but I know they need the Lord, and, and it didn't even cross my mind at that time when I could have shared until this morning. I missed. I whiffed on that. And I'll ask the Lord for another opportunity with this man. But do we have a passion for people? Do we even want a passion for people like Jesus had? I am so thankful for the ones who had a passion for others and sowed the gospel seed into my life as a young boy even. Mainly it was my parents. And I praise God that according to their prayers and efforts, God, He did the work. He drew me by His Spirit. And my mom was able to be the one who was there for the harvest. I thank the Lord for that. I was just six years old there in my front yard, and I knew that I was a sinner. But I knew also that Christ died for me, and He rose again on the third day. And with my precious mom's encouragement, I opened my mouth and I called on the Lord to save me. And He did, as He's faithful to do. He did that that day. And since then, I've been able to sow the seed to hundreds, or hundreds at least, if not thousands of times, to people and see others come to Christ too. And what I've found is that it's totally worth it. it. really is. But if I get sidetracked and I try to pursue other things as more important, Satan is pleased to see my passion wane and to see me have passion for all kinds of other things, for bacon or for football or for whatever the case may be, but not for people. Satan's interested in the demise of people. But God wants to save people. And he uses people like me and you to reach our loved ones, our neighbors, our co-workers, even our enemies. So to see the seed not being spread like it should is what Satan's all about. And I've been there more times than I would like to admit. But I want a passion for people like Jesus had. I hope you want that too. So, Heavenly Father, would you grant me and my friends here tonight a passion for people? Would you cause us to turn our gaze to that which is eternal? And, Lord, would you grant us the opportunity to sow more seeds, to spread the, the gospel seed out there with, Lord, passion and, and increasingly? And would you allow us to humble ourselves and, and give you the glory. It all goes to you. God, I thank you for saving me, and I thank you for those here who've been saved. And I pray that you just work in us this kind of passion that Jesus had. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.